Wow, I'm, I know I'm inspired. Um, and I'm gonna, I, I want you to be getting ready uh, to ask some questions. We're gonna have a couple of microphones going around and we want you to please use the mic, even if you're called on, uh, just so that everyone else can hear your question and uh, also because we are recording. But since I'm here, I, I get the first question. Uh, and then, uh, then I will uh, pass it off to the rest of you because we have time for plenty of questions. One of the things that I, in, in listening to, a wide variety of uh, businesses and organizations that were really inspired by doing something different to change a paradigm, design a new business model that would do have some positive social impact. And yet you talked also about, all of you kind of mentioned lots of different choices, you know, sitting in Starbucks, trying to figure out what to do, referring to Einstein, having so many different ideas. And we have many budding entrepreneurs here as well that want to make a difference. I don't know if one or two of you could address, how did you focus? How did you decide? You know, you had different, many different, uh, Ned was saying, many different choices of products to do and to focus on. And, and Mark, you were saying you sat around in Starbucks and, you know, kind of brainstorming with, how did you narrow it down? on what to do to really start to focus. And, and Jules, how do you pick which product? So I don't know who wants to start. I don't want to uh, have everything go through mine, but uh, maybe Mark, you want to want to how do you, how do you narrow things down for these budding entrepreneurs? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, I actually did three other things in parallel. And then when I got too busy, <laughs> and those were really good ideas too. I, I may pursue later, but I like this one the best. and. Uh, uh, you know, I developed them to a point. For me, it's always a process of making um, uh, whatever the subject matter is, the new thing that you think you've discovered, making that, uh, becoming an expert by talking to other experts and any information you can get and making that subject finite in your own mind where you, you, you think you have it. You may still be wrong, and, and I've been wrong in the past and pursued things for four or five years, and. There's a fine line between being a, um, a really good entrepreneur and just a, uh, a knucklehead, and um, <laughs> an irresponsible knucklehead. And, but but uh, that, you know, and being pers persevering when, uh, so there's a fine line, and you have to sort of know when that line uh, is there, but it's uh, believing in the idea, and, uh, you know, lots of people will tell you it's not true, and, uh, you know, the Thomas Edison quotes, it's, uh, you know, he usually picks things up when, where other people left off, and you know, people fail right, usually right when they're about to you know, get to a breakthrough. And so I think it's, uh, again, there's a fine line there, but it's, it's discovering where that line is, and then persevering over, you know, it's never easy. Um, and I always also, one other thing, I like to start with a really good story. If it's a story that, people understand, and it still may be a fine business if it doesn't have an easy, great story, but if it's, people can understand the story and the value of what you're doing quickly, it makes your project um, easier and more, more um, you know, there, there's ones that don't have great stories that are still good, but I, I like a good story, and that was Eco ATM sort of, everybody understood it very quickly, everybody had the problem, everybody could relate to it, and uh, so that was how it won out over the other ideas, which I also think were still good, so. Okay, thanks. Um, Jules, you were commenting related to this continuing is that you actually help develop uh, and expose some of the ideas that entrepreneurs are developing through your very innovative model. How, how do you select which ones? One a day, I mean, you must get so many recommendations. We're deluged because there's such a need for what we do. And can you hear me? Is it, is it working? Um, so we have, you know, we see sort of 40 ideas for everyone we might pick. We're a lot like venture capitalists, but it's, it's, it's a, there, it's on. It doesn't sound like, you, maybe just pull it closer, is that better? Okay. Um, so we, we have this window on entrepreneurship that's amazing, right? And uh, first of all, we pick based on uh, whether it's a great story, because People are going to see the Daily Grommet either through their email every single day or Facebook or Twitter or on another site like Yahoo. We syndicate, we distribute these stories around the web. If we're not worth people's time, 
they won't open those emails, and they open them at an amazing rate, and they never unsubscribe. So we have to first be worth someone's time. And getting someone's time is way harder than getting their money. So we start there. It has to be quick, entertaining, and worth their time. Then we make sure it's a true story, because there are plenty of stories that are entertaining or interesting, but not true. So we, um, we use the web to, to do some initial vetting, but then we, we gather samples of the products and really do test them throughout our team or outside of our team as needed to make sure that the technology really delivers, that the design is really what it's supposed to be, that the social entrepreneur really is giving the percentage of sales that they're supposed to be giving, that it's not just greenwashed if it's a green enterprise. And sometimes the stories aren't true, and the only thing we can forgive is bad marketing. A lot of these companies are really bad at marketing. That doesn't matter because we're going to sort of take over an aspect of that. And one of the things I, I know when you're talking about broader entrepreneurship lessons is make sure you're working on something big because it's just as much work to do something small as something big. It absolutely is. So I, I get a little sad sometimes when I see somebody solving a really small problem and they're putting their life savings or their life work against it or a really bad idea, like we saw a perfume that makes women smell younger. <laughs> Is this, does this deserve space on earth? I don't think so. And so, you know, we see a lot of things like that, that we just can't get behind single purpose gadgets that take up resources and space and solve a small problem. But work on something big. Okay, I have more questions, but I have already have some other people that are kind of waving me down. So I'm going to pass it off, and we have a first question right here. I'd like to ask everyone uh, if you have a question to kind of raise your hand, and when, you, when the microphone comes to you, if you could, stand, if you could introduce yourself, please. Sure. Michael Brower. Um, thank you, panelists. I appreciate the feedback today. And uh, Mark, I appreciated the uh, Thomas Edison quotes. One of my favorite is vision without execution is an hallucination. Um, and I can't agree more with what Jules said about thoughtful consumption, because I think we are entering a mind consumption period where I think the mind will determine what it truly should purchase, and hopefully it aligns with their values and the characters of the consumer. So um, I'm very excited to be involved with a patented a uh, green product that we'll soon launch. Very excited about it. I think it's truly authentic and green. And we were quite frustrated as the uh, oil spill situation happened that uh, massively affected many consumers, employees, uh, Americans in the Gulf states be affected. And we sat by and watched toxins being sprayed on toxins and thought, that doesn't sound to be the right solution. We thought we had a better solution. We tried to work through our political connections, through senators, through below senators, through every possible function we could, get somebody to take notice. And we're still going to continue that process. And I don't mean to shamelessly plug what we're doing, but we do, I think, have a, a solution. But the greatest wisdom I got in terms of how do you get somebody's attention, have Bill Walton call Anderson Cooper and go down with Anderson Cooper on a TV program. I thought it was brilliant. Bill, stay tuned. Uh, but anyhow, my, my question in a long-winded way is, besides voting and exercising these kind of changes that I think we all need to make, what can we do to get people to notice there are solutions out there for a lot of the problems that impact our, our country, our state, our employees, uh, and get people to take notice and at least get them to try? Because sometimes I think politicians and our government tend to get in the way and interfere with, I think, true progress. So besides voting and exercising that vote, how can we get them to listen to bright ideas? Well, well we made a president with social media, so <laughs> you're going to hear me answer those kind of questions quite often with those tools and technologies that um, are accessible and free for us all to have a vote. So we can decide you know, what organizations get support merely by communicating with those media. I mean, it used to be, I, I, we're kind of, kind of taking like the 60s where it was, you know, very laborious, right? It was a phone call to organize a protest and then you had to get major media to care and there weren't very many people who, who could do that. Ralph Nader or somebody like that could do that. That's what's really cool now is that we all can do it. We all, we are the media. So I really emphasize that in terms of, you know, Facebook and Twitter at the most basic level, blogging, 
commenting on blogs and commenting on uh, major media articles and, and expressing our, our opinions that way. Yeah, for us, um, you know, we have a product that's a little different. Um, it's sort of always hidden. So, um, and whether it's a house or a surfboard, there's still a lot of fashion involved. So, um, or trend to it. And because of that, the, the green or sustainable aspect isn't the first thing people look at. You know, for us, performance of the product has to be number one. A competitive price has to be number two. And the fact that it's green is sort of a bonus. Um, you know, a lot of people think there's a premium for green, and in our particular product, it actually costs us a little bit less to make a green sustainable product. So um, we have to hit the performance and price first before we even get to talk about sustainability. Okay, we have another question over here. Please introduce yourself. Yes, good morning. My name is Daniel. I'm a student in the uh, evening MBA program here at USD. And my question is uh, primarily for Stephen, but then I'd like to open up the second part of the question to the panel. Uh, my first question is why you decided to start a nonprofit rather than a for-profit with your idea. Uh, and then my question for the rest of the panel is what you see as the role of charity as we move forward. Um, I think we started started off with a nonprofit organization because we were maybe under the impression that, that that's where uh, movements like this come from. That's where this would be our best uh, way of facilitating building these homes was through donations. Um, I definitely think there is room to explore uh, business with these and making it so that a nonprofit, as a nonprofit, making it so that you're not reliant on donations or you're not subject to uh, an economy or someone's giving. Um, we're definitely you know, looking for how we can make, make it so that we can cover our own expenses so that we don't have to be subject to anything else. Um, so I'll answer the, the charity part. So we, we, uh, our eco team is actually a, a charity tool, um, and you can, you know, turn the money into charity. Micro charities can load on our machines, and we, we, we're currently working with a few. Um, as a company, we also um, do some charitable things. Uh, we'll do more when we're profitable, but uh, we plant trees for all the devices we collect through Trees for the Future. Uh, in Haiti, um, but it's interesting when I was considering this idea in Starbucks and I, I did a survey monkey of um, four or five thousand people, my closest friends, and um, <laughs> they, when they answered the question about charity, um, you know, and I, the question I don't remember exactly, but would you recycle for money or for charity or whatever, I think it was 40 some odd percent said, yeah, I, I wouldn't do it for the money, I would do it for charity. In practice, in the field, you saw the video of the charity button. It's only uh, used very seldomly. Uh, <laughs> so you know, people want their money, and uh, they and, and so again, going to the point of aligning the uh, you know the profit motive. I think everybody wants not everybody. Most people, ninety-five, want to do the right thing. Um, it's making it convenient and easy and incentivized and putting it in their path and. Um, and that's what I mean by aligning that, those two motives, where they want to do the right thing, but it's, it's, a, it's a pain to get the thing out of the drawer and to give it to somebody for free and, and go to the zoo or wherever your collection box is, and uh, we're incentivizing that. So I think that's, that's part of it. Uh, Hugh, do you have a question? Good morning. Hugh Constant. Uh, I'd like to ask Stephen, uh, you mentioned that your homes use less water or not connected. Uh, to the water table, if you could explain that. Uh, yes, um, in the case of building in Tijuana, you're actually required by law to tie into the water and electric. However, with um, the shape of the roof, you can uh, collect rainwater. You can also uh, shape them to condensate um, fog or mist or things like that. Um, so you, you do have off the grid options and you can tie in, but uh, it's very important is, is how you use it efficiently. So. Currently, uh, in all the homes built here, all of your wastewater goes to the same place. You have a, a septic tank where all your gray water from your shower and your sink it goes and combines with your black water. 
from your toilet. So this isn't, you know, this isn't sustainable. This isn't very smart. Um, so what you can do is all the water that comes from your, your, your washing machine, your dishwasher, your, your um, shower, your sinks, things like this, these can all, all then go into what we call uh, gray water botanical cells. And it flows through uh, literally a garden that can be indoor or outdoor. And it uses that water to produce food. And then um, as far as sanitation is going, we're looking, uh, we're looking into ideas as far as how to take sanitation off the grid. Take it instead of everybody being connected to one system, we're looking at how, we, how can we make waste on-site treated. And looking into things like uh, nautical toilets or biodigesters. There's all kinds of things that we can, you know, instead of, it's quite a burden on, on governments to get into to shanty towns and install public infrastructure. Let's, let's try a different approach. Um, I'm Lisa Schaefer from UCSD. Um, as an educator, I'm interested in training students who can get jobs and be useful and help you all be successful and become more of you. Um, so when you're hiring people, uh, what kinds of skills are you looking for? How well do you think we're preparing people to be employees of your companies and other companies like yours? What can we, how can we do it better? Uh, for us, uh, we, I have two partners that I started the business with, and uh, we all do everything. Um, we sweep the shop floor, and we set up a project. I mean, we have to do everything. Um, and the people, we, we, we get a lot of inquiries for people to come work with us. They always want to come in on sort of a middle management level, and uh, we, we're not, our company's not that size where we can absorb middle managers. Um, so we need people that are forward thinking, but aren't afraid to get dirty either. So you really, especially with a younger company like ours, we need somebody that has the skills uh, that an MBA program would put out, but also has the desire to just get in there and get their hands dirty. I can give you a couple of practical tips for getting attention that, um, well, first in the requirement side, and then I'll do the practical tips. I, I look for people who can restate our vision in their own words, that they've internalized it. We want to change the world. We want to change how marketing works. We want to change how products get discovered. That's huge. And if they only kind of skim the surface or get just a part of it, and they can't restate it in their own words, I probably can't bring them into the team because they have to have an internal ability to push themselves forward against that vision. Practical tips is our, our um, we had a, an intern last summer who caught my eye because she read my blog and said nice things about it. And when you write a blog, you get really like self-conscious because nobody reads it and you hope someone reads it. And she just picked up on a couple of the things I'd said in my blog, wrote a three-line email, really short, and it got my attention. And I do that myself when I want to get attention from somebody. Um, I'll put comments on their blog because, and I mean it, I don't write empty comments. I write things that I, I, want, I want them to know or talk about. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing that um, people don't use enough, and this is, again, students, it gives them a great advantage. If you write, let's say you want to establish competency in an area or you want to go into a new field or you're a student and you don't have any competency yet, you write reviews of books in your subject matter on Amazon under your real name. And when people Google you, under your real name, they'll see reviews of books that, you know, express your interests or your, your future interests. And nobody does that. I don't understand it. You know, when I do, you know, kind of review of job candidates, I don't find very many book reviews. It's so easy. We have another question over here. Good morning. My name is Nagin Mirahabi, and I'm an attorney here in San Diego. So as a preface to my question, I do believe that social media is a nice gateway to allow young budding entrepreneurs and activists to showcase their endeavors. But I also think that it could be a double-edged sword, meaning that the average consumer is often inundated with so many messages about the green movement in particular that it can often, pardon the pun, um, make them feel blue. So for each of you panelists, what kind of techniques or what sort of messages do you see quite frankly, grab or grasp the attention of your audiences? Well, for us, we don't, we don't really do social media at all. We uh, rely on our website to be our only link with our customers. And uh, for us, it's a lot more hands-on. We go out in the field and do 
personal business development. For us, we find people thank us every day for our messages. And they, this is the number one comment, thank you for telling me about this, which is kind of odd, because we are marketing products, but they're more, you know, we're, we're more journalistic. So it's how you approach the message, it's really important that, um, you know, the story is told from a sincere point of view. So that's probably the, the first thing of all, but um, it, people are really inspired, they, they want to be inspired. So going right to the source of the story is also really critical. One thing we've learned on Facebook, Tori taught me this, I, I thought on Facebook, you know, when I have friends who talk too much on Facebook, who post five times a day, I shut them down, I hide them, because I think they're really boring. But on Facebook, we found, the, uh, so Tori has shown me, she's very thoughtful about sort of the time of day when she posts something, how she balances a prior message to the next message so that it's a, a variety that inspires engagement so people can simply state their view or are getting involved with what we're, we're talking about, we're inspiring conversations, but I thought, she scared me at first when she started posting like four times a day on Facebook that we were going to be the boring, you know, you know two, person at the party who took up all the air, air space and people just talked more and got more engaged the more we talked. So I guess sort of a practical lesson that I've learned from Tori. Hi, I'm Kathy Myers from the USD Sustainability Office and Experiential Learning and Adventure Center, as well as a nonprofit, Polar Bears International. And my, I, my questions are, uh, Mark and Jules, what have you seen in terms of reclaiming the precious metals and all of the materials that are in those electronics in terms of uh, innovation and um, reclaiming and making new things? And Ned, how do I get your product as insulation in my home? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we have a, uh, and we're working in uh, three or four standards efforts uh, to sort of uh, bring some uh, consistency to what happens there. Unfortunately, in the U.S., there is not a domestic smelter uh, that does it um, the way it should be. The best guy in the world that does it is in Belgium, a company called Umicor, and they reclaim um, uh, 17 elements at the periodic table level back from, and it's, a, it's actually an energy positive thing. The plastics get, uh, it's, it's an amazing, it's a two, $2 billion facility, it's a couple of acres, and it, um, it, uh, it's a giant cauldron of the stuff going in, and uh, the energy from the plastics itself or what brings the other stuff to temperature and runs all the process. So um, we don't have that in the U.S. And I'm not sure why. Um, uh, Sims Recycling in the U.S. is the guy with the best uh, process here, and there's some guys in Canada, but it's amazing that we don't do a better job of that uh, here. It's okay, but it's not, uh, it's not perfect, and I think we as a country should make that investment, and I'm still perplexed as to why it's not uh, done cleaner here. You just explained why I didn't know the answer to that question. I don't see a lot of products that are doing that. I see reclaimed float rope and all kinds of repurposing materials, but not precious metals, not heavy metals, those kind of things. So now I know why. Yeah. As far as the insulation goes, we're, we uh, are working on a spray formula that can be put into houses for retrofit. Because the statistics show that for every dollar spent on weatherization, you actually save two dollars in real energy costs. We have another question, please. Yeah. My name is Dick Wright, proud father of Stephen Wright. But my question involves three of the four presentations seem to suggest that success was dependent on um, effective cooperation of government. And that can be fairly difficult, foreign government and our own government. Is there something like Gromit or some way to ease that for entrepreneurs where they could go to a central location to easily find the people to talk to, the channels to follow, to make their dreams come true? Well, Mark, I heard you trying to get ahead of government. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think I understand the question. I'm, I'm, 
I didn't want to imply that we're waiting on that. We, we're investing a lot in standards efforts, trying to make all the state e-recycling e laws uh, the same so the retailers can attempt to uh, comply and consumers, but we're not waiting on them. And the, the, the point when I went, I went through it too fast, but the point I was trying to make is that unlike the, uh, you know, the bottle bill and then the, the other stuff where the government had to come in and do it and provide the incentive, um, and then it evolved to automation. The automation that I showed here, I don't know how many of you use the bottle and can recycling kiosk, and they're, they're not big in California because we robbed the redemption war chest, and so the guys that were in that business got, got hurt. Um, but they're, they're on the East Coast, they're in Europe and Japan, and they're collecting lots and lots of uh, uh, containers that way because it's incentivized and people do it. Um, it's evolved to that after 40 years. Um, I'm saying let's just put the, make the, the motive, uh, put it up front, make it easy and convenient, and let's solve it in five years uh, for this stuff and not wait for the government. So while we're pushing on that front, um, we're not waiting for it, and that's the essence of our product. Um, to say a little bit, um, it, it, the government is definitely needed if you want to do things on a larger scale. If you want to do things the right way, if you don't want to get shut down in the middle of what you're doing. But I also feel that um, governments want to see what you can do first. So in our particular case, building a structure out of tires in California, uh, you would need to go through probably at least a year and a couple thousand dollars worth of permitting processes and all kinds of red tape. Um, so we just decided to invoke a little throw and do it anyways and figured people could thank us later. Uh, we, we pulled tires out of the river. We built a structure here. And it actually ended up working out because we found out that our building here could be classified as agricultural storage and would not need such permits. So now <laughs> by, by breaking the rules a little bit, we've actually helped ourselves. Uh, now we have, you know, you can show governments, we can show a government what is possible. and. Uh, we have a question over here. My name is Don Vogue. I'm an MBA student here. Uh, just four quick questions. I'd first like to say thank you guys for putting this on. This is fantastic. The panel's been awesome. Um, two for, for Jules. What was the uh, highest selling product that you ever featured? And then what was your favorite that you've ever featured? Um, and for Ned, um, what, where can we get your boards? And what's the uh, favorite break you've ever served? <laughs> Uh, two of the high sell I, I'm not sure which is the highest, but two of the high selling were um, a lawyer who's an avid outdoorsman invented this classical water bottle. So, you know, reusable, but, you know, when you, it's empty, it just folds into a little nothing. And, you know, again, improbable that this guy had no technical or engineering design skill could do this, but he did. I really like this entrepreneur, and we did really well with her, with her product, um, Sarah. Oh, I'm forgetting her last name. She's 80 years old. She's in Marblehead, Massachusetts, and she's worked in charitable, created three charitable organizations in Haiti over the last 17 years. And she created this line of nightgowns that are made in Haiti because apparently they're amazing indigenous um, tailoring and embroidery skills there that people just had no, literally no material and no outlet for. And so these nightgowns just sell like crazy because it's a little bit like your thing, the charity thing. Like people don't want to necessarily push the button and have something kind of just disperse away from them. But buying this gorgeous nightgown that Sarah just you know sends all the profits back to Haiti, and she's 17 years proof um, is really interesting. I love one of her quotes. She said, "Well, I can't sew, but I can organize." <laughs> you know, <laughs> I love her. Um, my favorite probably, don't, I, if they were press here, I couldn't say it because I'd feel really nervous about saying this in front, you know, I love them all, but I love this product, Soap Nuts, that um, is a, an entrepreneur in Texas. Notice that in the Himalayas, there's this nut um, that grows on bushes that has a natural uh, detergent property on its outside called saponin. So you take four of these shriveled up looking nuts and put them in a muslin bag and you wash your laundry, any laundry, no tide, no detergent. It's great for um, anybody with allergen, allergies. It's great for um, septic systems. And it's so crazy and probable. I didn't believe it. It's called Soap Nuts. Laundry Tree is the company. It's crazy about it. Um, as, as far as the surfboards go, we're not doing too much surfboards anymore. Um, but we still uh, put on, the, next weekend is our fourth annual Future of Surfing event, which is a green 
event up in Solana Beach that we started. And uh, you can come up there and trade in an old surfboard and get a free um, soy blank. And then we recycle those surfboards to artists or to a bunch of different things. And there's a lot of other green companies that participate in. It's a one day deal next Saturday. So you can get a blank up there. And as far as glassing, you know, the, the options to glass a board are, you know, there's thousands of combinations. But um, the boards I make for myself, I actually use a fabric that's made from kelp. And it's glassed with uh, UV cured linseed oil resin, completely non-toxic, washes up with soap and water. So um, you can make really good high performance surfboards out of, you know, clean material. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Yves Perez. Uh, I am uh, president of EcoHub, uh, San Diego's first clean tech green business incubator. Uh, we were actually asked to um, uh, showcase some of the um, uh, companies and uh, products that we um, incubate out of our offices uh, just right out here outside. Um, so some of them are out there on display. But uh, for Jules, the, the one question I do have for you <clears throat> is, you, I, I liked your presentation on social media and the, the advantages of that. And, and I've noticed that a lot of the companies that come into our offices already have some strategies that they're deploying and they are working. Uh, one thing that we've used in our advantage is um, uh, the touch and feel kind of concept to come into our office and actually, you know, kick the tires on this thing. Because when it comes to some of these technologies, uh, you know, when people watch the video, they can't actually, you know, touch it. So uh, have you ever considered uh, reaching out to companies or organizations like mine that are uh, incubating these technologies and actually helping them, but also uh, you can direct the consumer to say, this is where it's on display, go and touch and feel it, um, and... Uh, uh, then come back and maybe make a comment or something like that uh, if you if you uh, if you wish. So have you considered anything like that for your website? Well, I, we are doing a couple of things like that now. We want to do even more. We, um, last weekend in July, I went to the Detroit um, Maker Fair. So O'Reilly Media has a magazine called Make. It's for the DIYers of the world. It's one of the only magazines in in the country that's going like this. It's uh, five times its subscribers increased in, in three years. And one of their um, events, one of their, and how they make money is to have an event called the Maker Fair. And it's not a trade fair. A lot of the people show up and have a booth. There, people, there were 200 people who had sort of a booth there. Um, are, are not really necessarily commercially viable products, but they're getting somewhere. They're sort of helping each other by demonstrating what they're doing to each other. And, so I showed up there until I did some speaking, but mo mostly I was there to do the great grommet search, I called it, to find um, people who we could help, basically. And so some of them I could only help with our blog because they really don't have commercially viable products, but others we can go further. So I'm doing the same thing next weekend in New York City. They're calling it the World Maker Fair, so about 400 makers. San Francisco is the granddaddy, so that's, I mean, a little closer for you, not, not convenient, but they have, um, 100,000 people who show up in San Francisco when they do their maker fair. So I'm eager to go to that one next as well. So that's kind of a grassroots thing we do. Obviously, we, we uh, and, th and that physical thing is really cool. I like, I like doing it, meeting people that way. Uh, you know, mainly we do do it online because it's, it's scalable for us to reach out to people that way and help that way. We have a question over here. Hi, my name is Lars, uh, and I'm from the Croc School of Peace Studies. And my question is for uh, Mr. Wright. Actually, a few of them. Um, one is, how do you decide where you work? And two is, once you're, once you're there, do you have any community-based decision-making models? Of, like, how do you decide um, who has the most need for this house rather than who's got the most muscle and access to you to get a house for themselves? Like, are there any community-based mechanisms to decide um, who's in most need of one of these houses? And, and third, just recognizing in like slum communities, I mean, among the, the myriad of problems, like one I would perceive to be would be just squatter housing or a lack of like land title. Um, how do you work in that dynamic or have you experienced that? And if so, how do you work in that dynamic um, 
where you can create like sustainable housing that's not going to be run over. Someone's going to come in and say, hey, that's a great house, but I actually own that land. Like, how do you work in that context where that might be a fuzzier, nebulous uh, a realm of who actually owns the property um, where you might work? Um, so the first question is where, where we would build. Um, right now we're focusing on the San Diego Tijuana area because this is where we're from. Um, and this is also a place that I think really this is a place uh, where there's enough support and there is, um, it's really too logical of a solution. It will, it, it will start here. Um, I think w what we'll do is we'll begin to uh, probably expand uh, looking into Mexico. Mexico and the United States, I think there's a huge issue with tires. Um, looking at uh, uh, poverty levels in relation to tire piles and, and things like that. Um, as far as things like who gets, who gets a house first, those are, we, we want to pride ourselves on being you know, culturally variable, culturally flexible. Um, those are decisions that we feel are, need to come from within the community. Um, it's, it, it won't be our job to decide who gets uh, a house first. Maybe we can help collect empirical data, do some um, anthropo anthropological type of work, and uh, maybe kind of quantify the situations people are in. But um, I, th I think that is a, a decision that would have to come from the people as far as who gets a house first, who's willing to put in the work, who's willing to do things like that. Um, as far as squatter housing goes, like the, the, the community in Tijuana where we want to work, there are a lot of squatters. What we have learned um, in, 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 in making some connections down there is that uh, our best opportunity to build uh, initially will be on, on legal land, something that's either acquired or donated or, or, or something along those lines. Um, but as far as getting into the squatter, squatter towns, uh, We've discovered that, that the squatters are generally directed more towards uh, ejido land or towards government land. So if they're already on government land, it is our hope that we can work with the government. And um, because we do offer a service like waste reduction, because we can sort of promote social rest in an area that is uh, perhaps volatile in the future, um, that we can then uh, maybe get access granted to work in some of these areas bring it to those areas. Uh, thank you. I know we have more questions, and I, and I apologize, but we will have a chance to continue during the break uh, for more questions. But I, I just, you know, there, these were examples that were quite different, uh, some similarities, but one thing that was very common uh, through all of these examples, besides being the founders, the entrepreneurs, uh, the people were, that were very passionate about turning their dream into a reality uh, was that they looked, they saw a need, uh, and they were very innovative and entrepreneurial and uh, producing products that are providing social goods. So thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.